Uh, good evening and welcome to our Saturday Live Wellbeing at Home session. Um, big virtual hug to our regular attendees, so really lovely to see your familiar faces and names and a special welcome to those of you joining us for the first time. It's great to have you join our community, it's a special Wellbeing at Home community. And uh, for those of you who are new to our community, we've been running these regularly from back in April 2020 when we entered our first lockdown. Um, and we really started running them as a way to empower you, you with tools and information to keep yourselves happy and healthy. Um, for those of you who don't know, we are a wellbeing travel company. And since we can't help you escape, we want you to stay healthy and happy at home. Hence, we have created our Wellbeing at Home platform, which I hope you're enjoying. So um, I hope you've all had uh, a good week. Uh, there is, I believe, light at the end of the tunnel, despite all the doom and gloom news. And um, hopefully we've all learned a few things to improve our lives during this time and to really kind of help us reevaluate what's important for us when we come out of this situation. Um, one thing we can all agree on, I hope, that our health and our well-being is the most important thing in our lives. I really believe that and I hope you all do too. So I really want to acknowledge all of you for taking the time to come along to these sessions because that's what we're trying to do, kind of empower you with all this information to, to make yourself feel better. Uh, so a couple of bits and bobs to cover before we start the session with Martin. Uh, we sent out a survey about a week ago regarding our Wellbeing at Home service. Uh, those of you who took the time to answer, huge thank you to you. If you haven't yet, please, please take five minutes just to complete it as it will really help us. Um, and then for those of you uh, who were present at Olga Hamilton's excellent session about boosting our metabolism through our nutrition, she has now posted in the nutrition group on the forum the slide about um, the acomantia, which though I, if, if you were there or you remember, it's this microbiome, a special microbiome in our gut that helps us boost our metabolism naturally. And so she's put the slide in the group which shows you which of the food types that can help create the microbiome the Akamansia microbiome. Um, if you haven't yet joined the group, um, please do as we've been posting some other interesting things, including my recipe for my very delicious orange porridge that I think everyone should try, even if I say so myself. Um, so those of you who enjoyed Dina's mindful drawing session, we have a date now for our mindful painting masterclass, which will be with Zena herself. And I'm personally very excited about that. I can't wait to do that. Um, so we'll be sending out an email about that early this week. Look out for that. If that's um, interesting to you. Um, finally, we are working with our techies behind the scene to improve the forum. And we're learning all kinds of new things, uh, which is great. But we have now introduced a review section for each event. So if you click on the event that you're in now, you'll, be, you'll see a button where you can submit any comments you've had about the event, like a review button. Um, so that will really help us promote the events, but also learn from you about what you think about each one of them um, and what was particularly valuable for you in, in, with regards to that, that specific session. Right, that seems like a bit of a long list today. We don't usually have such a long list. But uh, let's finally get to Martin. So um, I'm really, really happy to have Martin um, here with us today, who I met by chance. It was kind of a synchronicity. And, um, and I've got to tell you, when I had my initial chat with him, I couldn't believe some of the stuff he was telling me. And then I thought about it. I was like, gosh, that really makes sense. Um, so he's a physio, uh, but he's a different type of physiotherapist. Um, and he takes a really com completely holistic approach to the body. And he will literally enlighten us on what we can do for our posture, but also just to stay overall physically healthy. So as usual, post your questions in chat as we go along. And what we'll do is we'll periodically try and cover those as we're going along. So Martin, hi, welcome. Hi Stella. No, thanks for, uh, thanks for the invite. Looking forward to it. Thanks for being with, with me. Um, I forgot to mention my background because 
I'm just dreaming about being in the Caribbean. So uh, I usually just have my background walls, but I'm also alongside with the music, I'm playing around with background. So I, I encourage you all to do the same thing. Martin, sorry. So thank you for being with us. Um, let's just kick it off because I know you've got loads to share, but before we do, can you just explain to us what's the difference between a neurophysiotherapist and a regular physiotherapist? Um, well, in terms of neurophysio, you're looking, it's more neurological, neurological approach because um, all the different disciplines will influence your body position. So um, as opposed to where I used to be, where I treated maybe 10, 10 years ago would be very traditional physio, which is actually treating that body part that's injured, uh, treating symptoms as opposed to looking at the whole, the whole body. Um, so I've been qualified 20 years now, a first 10, 15 years in professional sport. And then I found um, an American's work about a decade ago. Um, and that was all trying to fix myself. That's why I got into this. And it's this deep rabbit hole that I've gone down, especially in the last 10 years. And it just gets deeper and deeper and deeper. But the American stuff, um, like I say, I found it 10 years ago. And that was the best uh, approach I'd found postgraduate after spending you know, a lot of money on postgraduate training, every physio course that you could do after you qualified. Um, so I went out to the States probably seven or eight times to do the courses and got certified in it. And probably five years ago, I would have thought I'm pretty good at this stuff. But then I met a colleague out there in the States um, who's more a really good friend now, but he's sort of mentored me in the last probably four or five years. And yeah, he's just taken it on another level really. So that's where I'm at, yeah. And it's completely different to how I used to practice. It's a, yeah. But it's quite unique, right? This like, isn't something most physios know. I'm, you know, I know you're quite humble, so I don't want you to. No, no, it's, uh, but it's uh, it is quite a unique approach. It, it is. Um, it's very different. It challenges all the other disciplines and that's why sometimes it, they don't like it they like to stay in their little box and not you know a lot of dentists don't want to acknowledge that that can influence the body you know they just don't want to go that way um but as you you know once you find these people and it's took me a long time probably you know five six seven years of finding the best people in the world and i, and I genuinely think i have got the sort of team around me now is the very best. The only thing is they're all getting on a little bit. <laughs> Some are in their 80s, so they have to sort of pass that knowledge on, and that's that's where we're at, really. So, yeah. Right. Okay. Should we kick, should we kick it off? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that'd be great, yeah. So if I just uh, put this up. So can you see that, Stella? Uh, no. Let me just see. One second. I think I might need to. Do you need to? Do I need to give you. Uh, no, you should, yeah. no, you can. You should be able to. Okay. So if I share a screen. Did you see the presentation though, then when it popped? Did it yeah, pop up? Yeah, not right okay, now. Great. Before it was there. Uh, let me find it. Share it. Ah, there we go. That should do it. Yeah. Give it a second. It'll catch up. No. Uh, one second. It's just. It just says the screen sharing is paused. One second. Sorry about that. Very strange. One second. What be a second? I can put Lionel Richie back on. <laughs> You can all have a sing along until Martin comes back. <laughs> the beauty of technology. <laughs> oh, it's so nice to see you all. <laughs> uh, can't find the presentation. No. Okay, hi everybody. <laughs> uh, let me stop sharing, we share. Yeah. There you go. Is that it? Yeah. Beautiful. There we go. There we go. We just, we just needed the boss to sort it out. <laughs> it's great. I love it. <laughs> so, okay. 
so this is the, the sort of title. The, um, the, the thing that I'm interested in going after is, is the airway. And I know I'm a neurophysio, but, but it's the airway that influences everything. Um, so let's make a start. So, so yeah, the approach I'm using is, it's very different from traditional physio. It's combining all the very best disciplines. So the very, um, the, the cranial osteopathy, that's quite a key part of it as well. Um, now that's not taught in physio school. We pretty much stop at the neck in physio and no one really talks about the, the cranium. Um, and that is, is, is integral to what I'm doing. Um, so yeah, the osteopath that we've been working with is uh, 84 um, and he's based out in Tampa Bay and cranial osteopathy, uh, very powerful. Um, but this, this man is basically, it's, it's a relatively new uh, discipline. I mean, it's only been around 120 years and he knows the sons and daughters of the founders of cranial osteopathy. So it's not, it's not a gentle uh, technique. It's quite, it's quite strong, actually. You're putting quite a bit of force through the skull. Um, so that's a key part of it. Um, the optometry. Can, can we, Martin, before we go, we get lots of chat messages. Can you click on the slideshow? So you see it. Uh... Just let me... The there we is that, go. Is that better? Yeah, that's better. Yeah. Okay, it's coming up now. Yeah. Yeah. So the physio would be more looking at sort of rib cage position, pelvis position. Then you combine in the cranial osteopathy, which ties in uh, with the rib cage, obviously. Then you're just looking, I work with the uh, optometrist. Um, and again, very different. Uh, way of looking at things. So this is an optometrist who is based in Milan and I met him three years ago uh, and he's a bit of a one-off and at the moment no one has got uh, his lenses uh, in the UK other than me and again it's just at the start we're starting to do some like research uh, studies with Milan mm -hmm. University um, and the lens he uses is 200 times weaker that you can currently get and again it's a very powerful tool and I use it for sort of diagnostics in the clinic um, so vision can influence your body, you know, so that's, and if you did see this optometrist in Milan, you would think you'd come out of his practicing. Have I just seen a physio? Have I seen an optometrist? Because you're combining it. So visual system, 80% of where you perceive yourself in space is coming from the visual system. So if that's compressed or twisted, that can influence your position during the day. So again, lockdown and people working from home, not commuting in like they used to changing the position and the pattern there's a lot more people struggling with like aches and pains. And again, it's because the screens that we use, we converge the eyes too much and we don't get out in the space. So that's, we're gonna go and talk about that in a little while. So the optometry, uh, the dentistry is, is a massive part, uh, probably the key player, because if, if the airway has got a compromise on it, you will put your head forward to breathe. Um, and then nothing underneath it will be able to shift. So again, there's not, there's a very small percentage of dentists who actually look this way. The, the airway focused dentists, they're not looking at teeth per se. It's got nothing to do with the teeth. It's all to do with the airway. Um, and I've got 20, 30 patients just before lockdown, the first lockdown, who would actually travel to, to New York to see my dentist. Um, because, and these patients are, I've got uh, hip problems, uh, low back problems, and they're putting my trust in me that this, by growing this airway, um, will be able to take the compensation off them. So um, the dentistry is key. ENT wise, um, very fortunate now to be working with probably one of the best in the world. He's based in um, LA, and he's called Dr. Zaghi. And again, he's very different in terms of a lot of traditional ENTs go after him, but he's, um, I really like him. He's, he's, a, he's a researcher, he's a scientist, um, and he's trained at Stanford, and he's got 70, 80 research papers out, uh, starting to put his way of um, how important the tongue is, and that's quite a lot of today's talk would be on that. Um, so again, tongue tie can really influence it. Um, and he's now, fortunately, he's going to train up two of my dentists in the UK. So uh, he's going to come across as soon as this virus sort of gets under control, he's going to come across and, and train them up. So 
that'll be easier for travel. Uh, and then podiatry wise, um, obviously the foot can massively influence things higher up. Um, and again, I use a, a, a podiatrist who's based in the States, um, very different uh, to what you can get in the UK. It's more of a neurological orthotic. Um, and again, uh, his, Paul, his name's Paul Coffin and he's based out in Nebraska. Um, but yeah, a lot of these people, the cranial osteopath is 84. The dentist in New York, Ted Belfer, is 80. Uh, the podiatrist is 75. So we need to get their knowledge and train younger people up um, and then put the science studies behind it. So again, very much in the UK and, and traditionally would be that every single box that looking at their own thing, the dentist is doing his thing. You don't get the integration, you don't get the joined up working. And that's where I'm, I am now. And, you know, that was a frustrating thing about the viruses. Uh, I was planning to do five clinics in Milan uh, last year with, with Marco, uh, with joint patients at the same time, but obviously the virus, but, but we'll, we'll get back to it. So if we move it on a little bit. So it's just as you're moving on, I mean, it makes absolute sense that every part of our body is connected with the other. And it, I, I found it fascinating when you said, you know, it's something that I've never really thought about before, that the physio usually stops at the neck. But of course, the head, like what, that's when you told me before, of course, the head is going to have an impact on the rest of your body. Anyway, please continue. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, and that's like a, from a traditional medicine point of view is that they would deem that, that skull fuses at age 14 and there's no movement in it. But it, there's sutures in the skull and they, they, they do move we're not talking masses amount of movement but there is there is micro movement there and um, you can see it and some of the stuff the dentist is doing in new york you can actually prove it because you can actually grow a bone in an adult so but we'll move on to that but yeah i just put this one slide on just if there's an injury it's usually because there's a compensation uh, and we're compensating for one reason and that is to so we can breathe you know so you'll see a lot of the kids these days as well, because there's more iPhones, there's more iPads, there's more screen time for these kids. There's a lot that will have a really strong forward head posture. Um, and again, often if the head goes forward, the airway is twisted. So that's probably why the head's going forward in the first place, because there's actually compression on the airway. So they're doing everything they can to, to, to breathe, really. So let's move on. So yeah, these these would be the, the the two main things really is getting nasal breathing and then improving the diaphragm position um, because anyone who's got an injury or is in pain or has got things going on that diaphragm and the diaphragm is a is a main muscle in your in your body to breathe with um, and often it's not in its right position so if it's in correct position it can't be used effectively and then you compensate with something else so. Um, let's just see any neck headaches, clenching, grinding, their diaphragm, they're not breathing correctly. So they're trying to use a neck to breathe. So let's just move that one on. So this is just like a bit of a roadmap of, of where it all sort of ties in, in terms of you assess someone in the clinic, have a look at what pattern they're in and see how, what, um, what's going on in terms of rib cage, pelvis. That's then you're looking at this key part early on is the cranial osteopathy um, because that these patterns need to be taken out in the clinic um, and then you take them out and then you see if someone can start to then improve their um, new position. So it's very different in terms of it's very active process as opposed to passive. This is not someone who wants to just lie in a physio bed and get the back rub for half an hour. It's giving them the tools to fix themselves. And there's a the lot of people out there who, who, who want to do that, you know? So you address the skull, the cranial stuff early on. Again, footwear can have a big impact uh, on people. Sometimes just changing the footwear, uh, give them a bit more stable shoe, that will um, improve their reference and then you'll have a knock-on effect. And the tests in the clinic will show that as well. Then we go a little bit higher up um we're looking if they're if if they can't improve or they're not going anywhere and these tests don't get better then why is that what's holding them in this position and often most of my adult cases will be a dental component going on so that needs assessing and again 
took me a long time to find these dentists, but at um, least I do have access now to a couple in the UK who can sort of help me on the way. Um, vision can also have a big impact. Like I said, if one eye is stronger than the other, if there's astigmatism, if there's a very strong uh, prescription on someone's lenses, that will uh, can influence your position of your body because what it does is it compresses the space. So what happens then is that compression goes onto your body and then things will tighten up. So if you're deep arching your back, um, a lens that's got a lot of power on it can still have a massive effect on you. So that's where I, uh, this is where it gets complicated, but a lot of the optometrists in the UK when they assess you, you sat down in the, the room, you're not in standing and they're testing sight, not vision. So they're looking at, can you see X, Y, and Z on a, on a chart? They're not looking at where you perceive yourself in space. And that's the biggest difference between the optometrist in uh, Milan and a traditional optometrist. Um, and there is, there's, there is a, like a, a sector of optometry called behavioral optometry um, and they're, they're classed as a little bit left field, but there's, there's few and far between. There's probably only 20, 30 in England. Um, and I've met most of them, but after meeting Marco uh, three years ago, um, he's gone on another level again. So again, just always trying to push things and try and improve it and just see what helps people the best. So can I ask you a question? Yeah. Because I don't fully understand um, the difference between sight and vision. Can you just expand mm -hmm. on that? Because you said you, you sit in a chair and you do an eye test, basically, seeing if yeah. you read the letters. What is the difference between that and the... And the well, a, a, the, the test that an optometrist does in the UK, Stella, would be for sight. It's testing what you can see, yeah. whereas a vision is where you perceive yourself in space. So there's allocentric and egocentric perception. It's a perception of where, where do you position yourself in space? You know, where am I in relation to a, a bed or a table? Or where is the, the space? Yeah. So spatial awareness. Spatial really? awareness, okay. 100%. One, awareness is a big one, yeah. Spatial awareness, yeah. Um, and then this slide, I need to actually move that. The nasal breathing needs to come down because uh, that's, that's key to everything. Because if you can't breathe through your nose, no chance. You have to have the be able to breathe through your nose because if you can't, you're gonna to have to breathe through your mouth and then you're gonna lose a tongue position. Uh, and the tongue is, well, it's probably 95% of what I'm doing is to do with the tongue. Um, and I'll show you later on some slides of what the tongue can do for the, the adult, for the kids, but also um, if there's not enough room in an adult or the tongue tied, that's where I'm using this ENT surgeon in LA to, to release it. Um, um, and again, the tongue is, is just, um, in, in an adult, it's what it does to your nerve. It's powerful in terms of neurological. Um, if you get the whole of the tongue in the roof of your mouth, it will stimulate um, parasympathetic nervous system, which is more relaxed, you know, as opposed to fight or flight. Um, and that's where a lot of people get this tongue stuff wrong as well, because they just put the tip of the tongue up. That will actually make you worse. That can actually tip you a little bit more forward. And what we're trying to do is get someone more grounded. Um, so let's move it on a little bit. Okay, perfect. So yeah, the first question that I, you know, if I'm doing something online with someone or if I'm in the clinic is, can you breathe through your nose? Um, and if you if you can't, like I said, it's um, that needs addressing because there can be so many different things that could cause it. Um, you know, it could be allergies in youngsters or a pet or certain foods that's triggering an inflammatory response in your body. So then you're getting rhinitis. And then if you can't breathe through your nose, bang, the tongue drops down. And this is why in kids, you got to try and catch it as early as you can, because if that tongue drops down, the tongue is the orthotic that grows the upper arches and grows the jaw. And if it's not there, what happens is the teeth, the pressure from the cheeks, the buccinator muscle will then push in, tongue comes down, and then you get sort of narrow dental arches. Um, and again, narrow dental arches is um, gonna be the floor of the nose. So again, they tend to get even more constriction in, in the nasal passage as it goes hand, hand in hand. And that's where the dental comes in. Um, so again, How common is it? How common is it that people can't breathe through their nose? 
Um, it's quite common, actually. Yeah. The... Is, that, is that from habit or is it because they just cannot breathe through it? Is it because they just don't? Um, and then it's usually something that kicks it off and then it becomes habit and then once you've lost that position of that tongue that then starts to become its new resting position and like i say once it's lost you've got to turn it back up to get the growth of the face forward um yeah it's it's really is big um again it, sometimes it could be trauma um or there could be a deviated septum or something going on but yeah, you, you have to then maybe sometimes scan it and, and see what's going on. Um, again, I know you've had like um, nutrition talks as well, but the, the nutrition is key as well, because if, if there's an inflammatory source coming that's causing the inflammation, that needs addressing. So that's where you have to refer out to someone who understands this sort of stuff. So again, the sleep's huge because, um, you know, anyone who's sleeping, who's snoring, uh, sleep apnea, waking up tired, needing coffee all the time, they're not getting into deep, restful sleep. And again, if you're not going into deep sleep, then again, then all the hormones are out and everything else. So they, they go hand in hand, you know, you've got to, if someone's a snorer and they're coming for, and they've got lower back pain, you've got to they go hand in hand you've got to fix the snoring you can't just it, it just won't work because then you if, if they're snoring the tongue's uh falling down on the night so uh let's go on to the next one so like i've mentioned already again that's probably the biggest take home from today would be the tongue and how powerful it is how vital it is there's a lot of really nice research coming out some most of it's from italy actually but they're doing a lot of studies and tongue position and uh, the influence on like lower limb strength upper limb strength and it's phenomenal how it changes things um so it's big in obviously swallowing breathing chewing um in children like i say catch them early and then that tongue every time you swallow puts pressure on that upper arch and gets the face to grow forward and again in an adult um it's more it's influence. You're not going to change uh, the structure of the adult face with the tongue alone. It's it's gone past. It's gone too far. That's where you would actually need a dentist to sort of help us on the way. But it still can be changed, you know. And I'll show you some slides in the, in a second that shows that. Um, you know, we so were chatting. Sorry to interrupt you. We were chatting the other day about how some um, yoga practices. Uh, actually refer to the tongue a lot about you know when when you're breathing and where to place your tongue um, kundalini yoga in in mm -hmm. particular and how some of the ancient teachings recognize this you know how important it is for that parasympathetic now could if if the face has hasn't um grown forward mm -hmm. could people still through certain practices could, could they help themselves without having to have surgery or, or yeah. uh, dental work? Yeah, yeah, you can. You can still train it. it. It gets trickier. I mean, I'm a good example. So the distance between the six teeth um, should be 42 to 44 mil. And I've only got 34. Can so I ask I everybody please to mute? Because there's a lot of background noise that's affecting um, that's affecting the quality here. If you can do that, that would be good. Thank you. Yeah, carry on then. All right. Um, um, I've lost my track. Where were we, what were we on about? Yeah, oh, that, was about oh, that was in and out. Was, I'm, yeah. I'm narrow, but I can still train my tongue to rest in the in the roof, you know. Um, some people who've, you know, they're actually so narrow that there's not enough space for that tongue. So if something's uncomfortable, you can sometimes, you'll see it as well. They'll have sort of like uh, scalloping on the tongue. They have little ridges where the tongue, there's just not enough room for it. Sometimes if something's not comfortable, you're just not going to do it, you know? Um, so yeah, you just have to see. Usually you can get away with it unless it's ridiculously narrow. That's where you would need intervention from a dentist, okay? So that's fascinating that the tongue should always sit in the always. upper palate unless you're eating or talking and it should always be that. Mm -hmm. I mean, how, how... Uh, nobody tells you that. I know. Uh, and again, just <laughs> anybody, does anybody here do that? And it can 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 people just put that in chat if anyone actually rests the roof of their rests their tongue into their upper palate? Yeah, they probably won't. And again, I've just treated a couple of doctors recently, just newly qualified doctors who've got low back pain, neck pain, grinding, clenching. 
And I, I mentioned and I show them in the clinic this stuff and they're like, well, never been taught this, you know, and that's, these are young medical students who just literally qualified. So yeah, it, but there's more, there's more stuff coming out there. There's some people putting it out there and yeah, it's just, you just need some studies to back it up. Yeah. Uh, they're mentioning there's mention of the book that you're going to cover in your the Brit the Brit James Nestor book yeah uh, James Nestor yeah yeah Martin's going to talk about that in a sec so it's good um so yeah the correct if if it can't go in the roof we have to say well why is that is it restricted is it tied um and again it's really the traditional medicine are not interested in that to be honest they don't think anything anything of it but, but it is key so as soon as I can I'll check you know the kids and stuff to see if there is a tongue tie um so there's different types of tongue tie and the one that gets missed is called a posterior tongue tie and that's where the surgeon from la who's is you can get get it done in the uk at the moment but um they probably don't have the technique nailed enough and what happens is it can regrow so they do a laser and they and if you don't get the right treatment afterwards it just grows back again so it doesn't it fails often so you have to actually have it cut properly sutured and then stitched down to stop it growing back um like i said the dentist who i've just been working with in leeds is he's, he's getting trained by him so that's going to be great for me because i've got hundreds and hundreds of patients that need it so is it tied is there enough space like we spoke about you know is the is the is the upper jaw just too narrow uh not enough room for it um like I said, in terms of history, snoring, waking up tired, clenching, dry mouth, these are all classics of mouth breathers. Um, and they would, again, on a night, that tongue would then fall back into the airway and then you're into interrupted sleep. Um, and then you're onto like sleep, um, sleep apnea, which is not great. So that's where, again, you're getting a lot more scientific in the last couple of years as well with this stuff. So scanning everyone's airway, doing a sleep study, and then putting the sort of what we find on the scan to what's actually happening on a night. So you're trying to, and as, as you improve these things, obviously you can do an, another sleep study and you'll have less sleep apnea. That's the, that's the key. So, and again, if that is the case, tongue tie or space, that's where I'm going to refer out, like I say, ENT surgeon. Uh, or a dentist who can help me. Uh, let me move that one on. So that is an example. In fact, I don't know if it's actually come up, has it? Just the position. Can you see that still on that slide? That's where the tongue should rest all the mm -hmm. time. So if there's the incisors, tip of the tongue slightly back, not touching the teeth, but the whole tongue is in the palate. So you see on me? It feels, yeah, it feels really weird for me mm -hmm. to do that. Because I'm obviously just not, yeah, it's very strange. Yeah. Uh, it takes some practice, but it, he, that's where it should be. Other than when you're talking or eating, that's where it should be. Okay. And this is an example of a young girl who had a tongue tie. And uh, the tie has been released by Dr. Zaghi in LA. And you can just see the change in sort of, what was that, six, seven months? Our face has gone forward just because she's got the tongue, lip seal, nasal breathing. Whereas if you didn't catch this, this girl would develop even further back. And then a, a traditional dentist would say, well, maybe overcrowd in and take the teeth out. So catch them earlier and grow it forward. And why was she like that in the first place? Then? So that's because she had a tongue tie. Okay, because she, she, yeah, yeah, she had a tie. So she but couldn't Lisa, physically. Lisa's asking what exactly is a tongue tie? Okay, yeah, good question. So the, the tongue tie is... Uh, that band underneath that frenulum mm -hmm. it can be too uh, tight so it's tied down and it needs to be released so the classic one is an anterior tongue tie where the front front of the tongue's just you can see a really tight band it won't lift up whereas the more common one which is in a lot of people is a posterior tongue tie and um, because a lot of people can get the tip of the tongue up but they can't get the back of it up and the back is the key because so that's a parasympathetic but that's where it should live. So let's move this on. So again, just ways to improve um, nasal breathing. Um, if someone can't breathe through the nose on a night, I use uh, breathe right strips, sometimes in a really short term, probably not a long term solution because if you, every night, sometimes the skin on the nose just gets irritated, but they do work quite nicely. I use the second appliance on this list um, a lot. 
a lot for athletes, for, for a lot of people. Um, you can get trial packs on Amazon for like 10 pounds, something like that. And it's like a ratchet mechanism. And that just pops in at both nostrils. And then if one's more restricted than the other, you can open it up a little bit more. Um, a nose cone, very similar appliance. But I tend to go with a mute a lot. I really do use that. Uh, and again, I'll use that for, like I say, athletes as well to wear when they're training. Um, we'll go on to this, like this mouth taping, you know, when you first time you mentioned this to a patient, they sometimes freak out, like, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> Why do I need to tape my mouth up? But um, the lip seal's key, because uh, the, if the lips aren't sealed, the tongue won't go to the roof. It's not possible. So uh, there's different sleep tapes out there. Um, the Mayo tape, again, sometimes you don't even need to tape the whole of the mouth up. You could just use a little piece, like, a centimetre by two centimetres, just over the centre of the lips. Um, but again, it creates lip seal. It really gets you into sort of nasal breathing, like Viteco breathing. That's what we're after. Um, and again, just cheap micropore tape. That works a treat. Um, and the, the book that we spoke about um, is, is a journalist that came out middle of last year, a journalist in New York called James Nestor, and his, his book's about, it's called Breath. Um the new science of a lost star and he goes back and traces like you know how we used to breathe all the yoga practices different uh, tribes how they did it different meditations um and yeah he, he really put it out there and it got some yeah he's got a lot of views as well in some of the podcasts that he did um and he did one with joe rogan and i think it had four million he'd maybe gone up by now but it's four million views and on that podcast uh, Joe Rogan asked him, where, where do I get that appliance that you the wore? And that's the dentist I'm working with. So this is the 80 year old dentist. And since the middle last year, phones not stopped ringing because that many people got options to it. So it's been really good actually. Um, but yeah, he wore an appliance, um, to, which I'll go on to in a little while to grow his upper dental arch. Um, and again, but the thing with him is like everyone, you want to try and catch him early. So you catch him, as a, as a child to try and get the tongue in the roof and that would have grown his arch where that didn't happen. He had allergies and all the rest of it, the tongue dropped down. So then he has to put one of these dental appliances in to grow it. Um, but yeah, it's, um, it's a powerful, powerful piece of kit, um, which will then grow the, grow the arch, give you some tongue space, tongue can go up, tongue comes out the air where you're breathing through your nose and things start improving. Um, and the dentist is called Ted uh, Belfer. Um, and again, he's training up a couple of UK dentists in this. So it's so interesting, isn't it, about the breath? You know, you uh, breath work has become much more popular now. We we've had someone on doing breath work. In fact, we're going to bring him back, and because um, yeah. it's really, but you know, so many people still resist that because they go, "Well, I know how to breathe. I'm not alive." Breathe. You know, you hear that stuff over and over. But it's so it's how you breathe which is so important yeah. and that can affect all of this. Yeah. It's fascinating. And even people, even people who are teaching it don't fully understand it, I'll be honest, because yeah. you can only breathe effectively if you're in the right position. Right. And if you're not in the right position, the diaphragm's not in the right position, you won't breathe. You're going to compensate somewhere else. So that's just a, a, a little slide of that's the appliance that I use a lot, the mute appliance. Um, and again, just in a short term before I'd go and get any scans and stuff. Sometimes, you know, if if there is a deviated septum or there is something going on in there that needs to you know that's where you need an ENT to go and maybe straighten things up a little bit so they can breathe through the nose um there's a breathe right strips is that is that the kind of um operate could you get that kind of operation on the NHS in not in normal times yeah you you probably could but again just the waiting lists and again it wouldn't be classed as priority and sometimes because in the nose there's a thing called a turbinate and sometimes a lot of ENT surgeons are too aggressive and they actually take too much bone out. And then you snook it because you're left with a condition called empty nose syndrome where you can get too much not uh, going through your nose. You know, those turbinates are there for a reason to sort of filter the air, flow the air. Um, so, yeah, then you have to have, so you've got to, you've got to find someone who actually knows what they're doing because otherwise you could make, make it worse. Yeah. So if we just move on to this sort of like the cranial osteopathy bit, the dental and the optometry and how it's all linked is because all these cranial bones are interlinked. Um, this human body is not symmetrical. It's, it's asymmetrically biased. Um, 
completely different, different rib cage, heart on one side, liver on the other, one diaphragm stronger than the other. Uh, and the face is, is also asymmetrical. Um, but again, in terms of how it can influence the jaw, can influence the teeth and all the different overbites, underbites, crossbites. Um, and the floor of the, uh, of the orbit is, is of the eye socket is, is the upper jaw, is the maxilla. Mm -hmm. So if, if that's twisted, if the upper jaw's got a twist on it, that's going to be transferred through the eyes. And that's where you can sometimes get one eye stronger than the other. And a lot of the kids who were classed in the in the youngsters saying, oh, you've got a lazy eye and they patch it up. Well, that's absolute, it's crazy because these, these eyes should work together, two receptors together. Um, and that's where my optometrist in Milan is a completely different take on it. Um, yeah, using a lens that is really uh, 200 times weaker than what's being used. And what it does is puts more light to the back of the eye um, and that reflexively just opens up the space. It's quite scary and it can just change people's vision immediately. You know, they can start reading uh, really quick and seeing things. So it's, um, that's where you have to be careful. It's interesting when you do, uh, if you have like a cranial uh, osteopathy session, I find this a lot, I'm sure a lot of people in here have too. I almost feel like my jaw has come forward after the session like almost like my upper mouth has come it's like realigned but not in my body in my in in my face it's just fascinating mm. and then as you say it has that effect on the neck the shoulders yeah. even down to the hips right they've they've obviously released some uh sutures there and your systems responded got more relaxed more parasympathetic and then the jaw often swing forward so right. you see that you see that a lot um, so again, like I said, this is completely different to physio, you know, this, this is not taught in physio school. This is what I've learned in the last sort of decade. Um, but I'll be honest, um, I learned more in a museum in Madrid than three years in physio school when we went to this museum and looking at all the different portraits, uh, because all these artists had painted these faces and that they painted what they saw. Uh, and you can see, uh, now asymmetry is normal slight asymmetry but you don't want too much asymmetry so this lad is a friend of mine he's a mid 40s 45 carl um he's a personal trainer he's a strong bloke now he has got a little bit too much asymmetry so again um the way that these bones uh, in the skull will then that will transpire and this is where the osteopath in the in the states the 80 year old has worked out that certain muscles in your body will test strong if that cranial bone's in that position um, again, a very clever, clever man, and we just need to get more studies on it because it's that powerful. So you can see this lad's face, higher right eye. You can see more of his right ear than his left, yeah? Um, Low right shoulder. Um, and then let me just show you what I did. So then I've just... But how did that manifest in his body? What happened? He's got, to... he's got quite a lot of back pain, this lad. Yeah. Okay. On, the, on which side? Like the side that... Uh, not necessarily, no, but okay. Okay. What, what, what happens is on that pattern there, the side of the left side of his face is less well developed. So the, the arches on the left side of his upper dental arch have come more in. So they're more narrow, more compressed. So he hasn't, he, he doesn't keep his tongue in the roof. And if it does, it tend to veer more to the right and create a pattern. So he really needs a bit of arch development so he can get the full tongue into the roof. Mm -hmm. but yeah, it would be back pain that he's got, nothing else. Um, so that is his, the right side of his face. I just made him symmetrical and flexed him a little bit. And you see how he's... You're not a plastic surgeon, aren't you, Martin? Yeah, he, just, he, he looks good, doesn't he? <laughs> he good. does. So, but I'll show you, this is his brother. This is the same man. This is his brother. That's the left side of his face, okay? So you see how narrow he is. And he, I mean, I'll go back a comparison. Oh, I've gone, let me just find a way. Sorry, where's my slide? There we go. So that is what I'm calling flexion. That's what I want. Expansion, space, not compressed. Yeah. And he looks pretty strong in, doesn't he? Yeah. So his face has kind of become wider. Yeah. So that that's what he would look like if I put a homeo block on the left side of his face after about two years. That's what you'd be looking for. You still would have some asymmetry some slight asymmetry because that's how we move you need the asymmetry to shift your body around um 
but like I said, this is where's the other one there. That's that's extension. That's compression, and that's yeah. There's no tongue space there, and his face grows long and it drops down, and you know it's um, a bit crazy, isn't it? So did your mate know that you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we laughed at that slide for a year because we yeah. just it, it's crazy um this is the appliance that uh is in that breath book this is the dentist that i work with in new york called ted belfer um he fell on it by chance to be honest he's, he's 80 years old and he's been probably about 30 years ago what was happening is because he was in new york central park he was treating a lot of actresses, actors, stage performers, and they wanted straight teeth. And he developed this appliance. And basically, when they were going back to the makeup artist, they'd be saying, what are you doing? Because your face has changed. And they're like, what are you on about? And that's what happened. And then he started to do bone scan before and after. Um you can improve nasal breathing and tongue position, but it's not going to grow bone. And this actual bad boy, it's quite a clever piece of kit. Uh, you just wear it on a night on the side of the face that's collapsed and it, it actually grows bone. So, yeah, there's there's a couple of appliances out there, but not 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 looking at the asymmetry bias on it, you know. Um, so let's just move that on. Again, these are appliances that kids can use the the one on the, the bottom of the picture that's what both my kids are wearing at the moment um that they're in that appliance to just i'm trying to grow them an airway basically it's all i'm doing it for they, they might not like me for it at the moment but um i don't want them to suffer the back pain that i suffered um and the best thing i can do for them is growing an airway and grow them an upper dental arch so my daughter's probably got, she's been doing it two years. She's got another six months to go and that's it. Done and dusted. Never any braces, never an extraction. And my daughter's 10 and her, she's a centimeter wider than me. So, and the bends going the same way. So they're just, the one at the top, probably not as effective as the lower one, but it's still trying to expand your jaw really. Um, so this is my, this is my son, Ben. Again, if you can see, in the picture that the dentist is holding up, you can just see how his lower jaw was starting to jet back. Can you see that? Yeah. And that's uh, when he stood up there, that's six months into treatment. Uh, you can see how his lower jaw, his face has grown forward. Yeah. Uh, and that's what that appliance is doing. Now, again, Ben is not a mouth breather. He breathes through his nose. Um, I'm thinking maybe it was the C-section that maybe did that because um, you don't get the normal compression on the skull coming out with a birth canal that can sometimes set off this expansion. Um, but I've, I've managed to catch it, I think. So he's looking pretty good. And uh, he's got another year, probably year and a half to go, and then he'll be done and dusted. Um, and how about those of us who were forced to have teeth extracted as young kids and had braces and to and push the teeth back into our mouths? And you know, now we're way ahead of that. What can we do to... Help. Well, you, this is the tricky thing. In an adult, you can, you can't rest. You know that if there's compromise, it's all to do with the airway. If that is compromise your airway, that's where it's difficult. You know, um, there's some of these appliances now that can. You know, they might take a couple of years, but they can grow a bit more space to actually try and put you back where you should have gone. You know. But this is what you're up against and I'm up against because dentistry is a multi-billion pound industry and they're not just going to stop doing braces on kids because they want to straighten teeth and, and make the money. They're not interested in airway. And again, I think it will only be down the line when you start getting more and more studies out there that things start changing. So let me just move this on because I'm conscious. This is again, he's a, this, is, this block's actually a dentist, a 70 year old dentist with a long list of health stuff. Um, chronic mouth breather and he had a homey block and you can just see and again there's you could find it on ted belfer's website to be honest as well but yeah he's grown his face yeah he's created tongue space um, i've got some questions yeah just before we go along we keep going just before we, we're going to go to the more practical part yeah, yeah yeah um but um okay from jane um in 2006, the jaw was semi-dislocated and supposedly rectified, but in the last year, she's had sensation that jaw is misaligned with bottom jaw 
and had a feeling of blocked right ear. Consultant did various x-rays but couldn't work out what was wrong. But looking at my bite where the front teeth don't meet, he said there's something very wrong. I often bite my cheeks and my bite has changed. Does this sound like it's... Yeah, I mean, to be and honest... Any... Herself up some to, at night by almost choking, where she feels her tongue has fallen and blocks her throat. Gosh, that yeah. sounds... Yeah, I mean, the lower jaw always plays second fiddle to the upper jaw. So any jaw joint problem, that usually the twist is on the upper jaw. Um, but then you have to, you to, you know, obsessively train your tongue to sit in the roof. You know, you'd have to see what's going on to cause that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so well, yeah. What do you suggest she does? Um, Come to you or? Possibly, yeah. I mean, you could. You you could, she could email me and we could have a chat and we can all this put a plan in action. But a traditional jaw specialist is just trying to centre the jaw and you have to understand what's going on with the rest of the body. Otherwise, you, you're just trying to balance like a wonky door frame. Yeah, you need to write the door frame straight first and see what you're left with. Yeah. Right. So just, I'm conscious of time as well for people. <laughs> um, um, yeah, sitting and standing posture. This probably would be quite key for... Um, obviously quite current as well with people working from home a lot more um, and again more and more office based jobs these days a lot more zooms and everything else um, the way I would set someone up to sit and stand is completely different to traditional postural advice you know I don't want people too upright and you don't want them slouched but the big thing is if you go too upright that then puts the diaphragm in the wrong position and then you're going to use your neck a lot so it's not comfortable so the four things that you can that, that you're looking at when you're sitting you want to have your bum right back in the chair bra strap or your upper back against the chair so sat backwards and then i would put usually a block or a two inch yoga block under both feet so that the knee is slightly higher than the hip it's not taught that most people are 90 90 or the knees lower i want more flexion more relaxed yeah and again if they've got a job that they're not having to be on the phone all the time tongue tongue to roof they're the four things in sitting um uh, there's a question here someone's challenging you actually okay that's good <laughs> we like we like better challenging yeah we do um, can you clarify points about knee higher than hip as i thought knee should be lower than hips to avoid sciatica no uh, um if if you've got a disc bulge maybe you wouldn't you wouldn't flex someone but the reason they've got sciatica is because they're too compressed um the, the the spine has got too much arch in it too much compression that then gives you the sciatica so you've got to try and open the space up yeah and that's why a lot of people i've seen who've had a physio assessment or a work ergonomic assessment and they're, they're setting them up at 90 90 and they're getting them up nice and tall it's not correct because they're in pain so yeah and definitely put the knee slightly higher than the hip so the opposite of what people are doing yeah 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 you just uh, what's this that you're doing uh, martin with your squiggly uh, i have no idea what's going okay. on okay <laughs> we've got a gremlin oh, we've got a gremlin <laughs> i don't know I must have hit some kind of pen or something <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> um yeah just moving on to um footwear again can be can have a significant effect um I'm looking for a lot more stable shoe. I mean, it's not everyone, it's not one size fits all, but the majority of people, you want to give them, ground them. And if the heel bone is out, is moving too much, is unstable, then you'll, you'll create a compensation higher up. So yeah, you really want to get the heel stable. Um, so again, really strong heel counter, mid foot of the shoe doesn't bend, um, plenty of room in the toe box. Um, sometimes, I mean, some people like minimalistic, um, like barefoot, that's another thing that's, you know, and it, it it's purely depends on how your body reacts. You know, I see so many people in the clinic and they've been doing barefoot and they're injured, you know, but they like the feeling everyone's different. Um, but I would say 95% of the time I'm putting people in stronger shoe, uh, stronger dress shoes as opposed to flimsy. Um, I get a lot of people. If they're working from home, I'd actually put them in a strong trainer during the day. So they're not wearing slippers at home. They're not wearing barefoot. They're actually in a trainer just to give them the neurological reference of the ground. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so let me just move that on. 
I forgot. Yeah. So yeah, this is just one exercise I thought we'd do. Um, I can just show you it's, it's safe for me to sort of prescribe without assessing someone. It's not going to cause any, any, any harm. Um, but we are sitting more, we converge at a screen more, we're more compressed. You know, if people are getting headaches, neck tension, eye strain during the day, clenching, bruxism, jaw clicking, um, you've got to try and get the diaphragm in a better position. Um, if the diaphragm then goes in the right position, when you breathe, you expand your rib cage, and then that will allow this neck to switch off. So let's maybe have a go at this one if we can. So yeah, if we want to have a go at this one, Stella, yeah? We'll okay. Just, just spend a couple of minutes on it and then we can... So we stand up and place our... We stand yeah. up and put our hands against... Um... Yeah, against a wall. A wall, and okay. Again, if, if I were doing it at home, if you've got where you could actually look out of a window so there's more space, so you're not actually looking, I know it's dark tonight, but if, you know, the more space awareness you can get, the better. So you're not looking at a wall. So yeah, if we set that up, so if you go... You stand up for me and then you want to sense the heel, the big toe, the little toe in the in the feet and then hands about 90 degrees against the wall and then take both knees towards the wall, Stella, just gently and that will just unlock your pelvis a little bit. Just tuck your bum underneath it. That's it. So you're rounding your back. We're not keeping it straight. That's it. And then take your sternum, take the breastbone back towards the ribcage so we, we essentially look like we're reaching there okay and then get the tongue the whole of the tongue in the roof of the mouth and then what you do is breathe in to bra strap area so breathe in through your nose try and breathe into bra strap and then fully breathe out so fully exhale get all the air out keep going and you get every last drop out and then you should feel your tummy muscles fire up a little bit. And then once all the air's out, relax the stomach. Let the tummy go. It's not bracing. It's not tightening up. It's nothing like that. It's relaxed. It has to relax to allow that diaphragm to go into its dome position. So then you pause for three seconds. One, two, three. Breathe into bra strap. Try not to use the neck, Stella. Just try and breathe it straight back. So you're going into your upper back. I don't know if you can see it on my screen. If you watch my upper back here. When I breathe in, bang, I can expand it. And then fully breathe out, get all the air out, keep going, get it all out. You feel your abs kicking in. And then once all the air's out, relax the stomach. Let the stomach go, pause it, one, two, three, and then bump, breathe in again, breathe into bra strap. So again, during the day, I usually I would do that for sort of like 10 breaths, 10, 15 breaths. Again, if someone's doing a lot of office work and they're doing a lot of screen work, I would throughout the day, breaks, get up, bang, do that, four or five breaths, just to get some air into this rib cage and just move it around a bit. It feels really easy. Yeah, it feels really weird about the tongue because you know we it, i do similar types of um you know cat cow yeah, stuff yeah. And, you know but no one ever tells you put your tongue in the roof of your mouth yeah, yeah you and, uh, and then also let your um diaphragm or your belly just totally relax afterwards that's really so this is a nice thing to do throughout the day yeah, yeah. That's brilliant thank you this is yeah. a safe, nice safe exercise there's different yeah. ways you could do it in all fours but Again, if you integrate standing, your okay. nervous system's getting the ground. Are you again, look, okay? So Lisa says, was she, "Were you looking down, or was I looking?" No, I yeah. no you look. No, look uh, just looking straight ahead. Okay. Yeah, look out. You're trying to get as much space as you can, so you're not converging your vision. You know, because you're trying to break the visual system a little bit, so you're going more space. Yeah. Yeah. I've got. I've got a few questions. We'll just get. We'll go through yeah. them now quickly. Um, uh somebody uh do uh, wakes up every morning with a blocked nose which goes after about five minutes she doesn't snore could breath strips help yeah definitely worth a try yeah, yeah. and is it wrong to cross your legs and feet because everybody does that right <laughs> um it can create it can create a bit of a pattern um yeah ideally you want to sit um like i said yeah with your feet above yeah, yeah. We're on the yeah. yoga blog and stuff like that. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, standing desks. What's your mm -hmm. view on standing desks? Yeah, I like them. Um, the one thing you've got to be really careful of, though, if you've got a standing desk, is that you don't lock your knees out. Okay. So if you stood um, 
if you stood and your knees are completely locked out, you'd actually be not detriment. It'd be detrimental. Yeah. So you have to slightly soften the knee. Otherwise, what happens is um, the thigh bone will go forward at the hip and then you'll lose position and that will cause discomfort in your lower back over time. So yeah. you want to you want to be grounded. But yeah. I think they're good. They're better. We're not designed to sit. We're not designed to sit for long periods. We should be out and about and shifting and moving. So, yeah, standing desks are fine. Yeah. Um, I'm going to cover this bruxism, bruxism mm -hmm. as you call it, because uh, Bree actually put, um, put that out there earlier. What can she do? So, she, can't, she can't open her mouth properly and, and she breaks teeth breaks teeth so she's really yeah Gosh, that's really that's poor yeah you, you have to assess why that is you know the, the reason people brooks or clench or grind is they've either got a really strong cranial pattern that they're trying to like detwist on a night or her airway is compromised and when she when she clenches she's bringing a lower jaw forward so depends how long standing that is but um you would have to see what's going on in the rest of the body because she needs to be grounded and then to switch the neck off um, and then if you still were getting problems that's where i'd probably get a, a sleep study or a cbct scan there might be a tongue tie there you know okay uh brie i would recommend you get in touch with martin it sounds like you need some some help with that for sure um what what about nighttime relaxing position on the sofa so true that one <laughs> Uh, no, so easy point. to like just lie down or yeah you know. i mean i would you're just trying to get the the arch out of the back really you don't want to be too arched in your lower back so let down flat with knees slightly like a hook lying position back flat that'd be working okay that's good um, okay so jane has a special um request here she was born with 12 toes has an operation at 15 months to remove two extra but the left foot is different has an extra joint and little toe sits a lot higher. I lean to the right when walking. Anything I can do to help balance posture and help back pain? Um, again, it depends how much compensation she's created in her foot. Uh, she might need a more stable trainer. Uh, she might need an orthotic as well. Um, not everyone does, but you just trying to change the reference from the ground. Um, and then she just can't shift pressure. She can't get off that right leg. So that's where you need maybe an orthotic to find the arches to then shift this body from left to right. Yeah. Well, my apologies. Oh, for the sound here. It's we've got a storm and um, the shutters are going a bit crazy. So, um, gosh, there's loads of questions. Are you OK to carry on a little bit? Yeah, yeah, fine. Yeah, OK. Um, um, I just... So I just put this one in, in terms of the vision, you know, if yeah. just to make people aware that it can influence the rest of the body, you know, um, if one eye is stronger than the other, it can create a twist up here. It can pull your perception to one side more than the other. Um, so yeah, do a lot of vision exercises to get these eyes working together. Um, again, if uh, someone has got a strong minus prescription, so they're short sighted, so they need the lenses for distance. If they're doing a lot of screen work, I wouldn't wear the lens for that or a contact lens. I'd actually take the contacts out or the glasses off for the screen because they're two different. Um, yeah, you, you, you can create problems if you actually go through that minus lens for screen work. And some people don't like wearing uh, glasses. They want to wear contacts. So they've got a really strong contact lens in, but then they're working, doing narrow focus work. It can, it, can, it can lock you up quite a lot. So I tend to put a lot of people, especially in varifocals, I would uh, ditch the varifocals. And I can show people in the clinic how it influences tests. And I'd put them in a lens for distance and then for screen work, they're in one that's going to expand it a little bit just to try and get them more relaxed. Um, okay, that's a really good point because I guess you're looking up and down all the time at the car. Yeah. yeah. No. And I guess most people don't even think about that. No. Um, um, but the, yeah, the, the, the vision and the lens I use stimulates a nerve the trigeminal nerve, which is involved in balance. That's why the tongue is so important. You know, it's, um, it's that, but yeah, give it a go and see how we are. But yeah, yeah. it's yeah. not just the tip. 
the whole of the thing. It will take a little, take a few days to get get used to it, but that's where it should sit. Yeah. Um. Okay, I'm going to come back to these questions. Is yeah. That okay? yeah, yeah, it's fine. Um. Uh, late pregnancy and post-pregnancy snoring. <laughs> Why and how to get back to normal? Oh, sorry, guys. I'm just going to put my. I'm going to let you just look at these questions and mute myself so I can sort out the shutters. Um. Again, it would be uh, trying to restore the pelvis position. You know, um, with the pregnancy, the relax, uh, relaxing of the ligaments go laxer. You go into more of a pattern. Um, and often a lot of post-pregnant women will go on and they become a little bit more unstable in the, in the joint. So then they start clenching and grinding to try and stabilize it. They're using the teeth for reference. Um, so yeah, you, you need to restore pelvis position, maybe different footwear. Um, yeah, that's what I'd be looking at with that one. So I'll just see if Stella comes back. Can you see the questions? No. So I've got them in the chat. Where's the chat? Well, she's just muted, that's all. Let me just, I'll see if I can grab the chat and then you can start. Okay, apologies, I'm back. Um, so the other questions I have here, um, any tips for stopping rounding on shoulder when on mouse at computer? I guess that's quite common. Yeah, again, that would be um, in terms of not not sitting up upright as much. So trying to get the upper back against the back of a chair. Um, the the shoulders you don't want to actually force them back because that's you just create another compensation. If the diaphragm gets in its correct position, that will generate pressure to <laughs> lift you. Um, but yeah, it's 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 a difficult one. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think we're probably going to have to wrap it up. Uh, there was um, there was a message here from someone who's a physio and she found your talk very interesting. Um, and have you got experience of patients with tinnitus and it's yeah. linked to TMJ? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Tinnitus, um, the, the, the more... Um, unstable the body is that starts to use different references and as we get a bit older we start to go a bit higher up that's where the clenching comes in often people are clenching to um, reference where they are in space and then the tinnitus is another level again so yeah it, it goes hand in hand um, because the twist on those bones in the, in the skull uh, influence in the inner ear so then they put the stapedis muscle in the wrong position so yeah tinnitus it's more and more chronic. They would have had a lot of symptoms for quite a while. Um, but yeah, it does fit with the jaw a lot. Right. Right. So people with tinnitus usually have that. But uh, 100%. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. And we'll just do one final one and then we'll yeah, stop. No uh, wake up with pins and needles in my arms to my fingers in both arms. I sleep on my back because of low back pain. What can I do? Um... Is it affecting sleep all the time? I mean, um, that might be a sleep study. It, okay. it could be, could be a few things. Tell yeah, that. Yeah, it yeah. These, be... these get these. I think, <laughs> I think. Um, can Martin do a general MOT? Somebody asked. Apparently, <laughs> 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 sure. Um... Anyway, look. What we'll do is we're putting. Um, we will put your contact details. Yeah, and if anyone's got any questions and they want a bit more in depth, yeah. just, just get them to email me and I'll, yeah, I'll yeah. respond. You can email, email uh, Martin. We'll put that on the forum. Um, we'll put a couple of those slides on the forum as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, the book, the breath book, would be is, is, is a good reference. I know yeah, if you've yeah. spoke about that before. There's just some really good stuff in there. Yeah, definitely. And um, this was really, really interesting. Thank you, Martin. It's just fascinating. And it kind of, it, like I said, it just makes sense, doesn't it? When you realize that we're, you know, we're holistically, of course, yeah, one system. with your, it's a whole system. You can't separate different parts mm -hmm. of your body. And um, 
and and then say okay i'm just going to treat this little part and it's going to get better it's just just yeah. doesn't seem intuitive or instinctive you know it, i think we're much more complex than that as human beings and um and thank you for doing your research no, and no, 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 going no. down this road and bringing and hopefully you'll get some people trained in the uk so when yeah. when um people don't have to go all over the world to get this kind of treatment <laughs> no no that's he's, he, the key is getting you know so it's accessible you know and then when more people start start looking it's not for everyone i mean if you've got a physio who's you know 50 45 50 and they've been a very strong belief system they're not just going to change it's a very different way of thinking you know whereas yeah um yeah once you start of open this pandora's box you can't go back i can't go back to doing what i used to do 10 years 15 years ago i just wouldn't i'd you know i just i'd find another job if i had to be honest yeah. I just, uh, now i know it's all linked i can't not look at it that way yeah yeah so, uh, but yeah no, it's, um Thank you for that. One thing we can all take away is think about where your tongue is, yeah. <laughs> your mouth, um, <laughs> sit properly, not too straight, not too with straight. the knees above, um, and do that little exercise throughout the day. I think that can help all of us, and um, and hopefully will have an effect on on everything with us, with our sleep and and um, and our breath and our aches and pains. So, mm -hmm. Martin, thanks a lot. No, no, thanks for having uh, me. Cheers, thank you, everyone, for coming along and your great questions. And um, we'll be in touch soon for next week. Next week, actually, we've, we've got um, a yoga session with a teacher from uh, who's originally from New York. And uh, we'll be doing kind of remedial yoga, uh, so uh, gentle yoga. Um, and I hope uh, you'll find that um, beneficial. I'm sure you will because she's great. So be in touch about that. Have a great week ahead. Um, stay healthy, stay safe, and look after yourselves and uh, see you next week. Bye, everyone.